And so we have both Robert and Igor presenting and Emma. Who would like to go first? Uh, I'm always happy to go first. I've just got to uh, find it first. <laughs> um, two seconds. Maybe I should have just done it on the reinstate missing cow digit Thunderbolt dock entry. I could talk about that for 15 minutes. Oh no, I think we'll go. <laughs> I think the rapid action would be more would be more useful. Cool. Uh, I will share. I'll get this to a reasonable window size first. Uh, oh God! All right, hold on. I've got to allow permission for um, Zoom. Uh, I have to quit and reopen. Maybe Igor should start, and I'll be back in a second. <laughs> Are you ready to go, Igor? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can. Go ahead. You've got until so, 45. Uh, yeah. So actually, yeah, as I mentioned uh, before, um, recently I was just uh, tweaking uh, GitLab SCD, uh, fixing like uh, small parts or maybe uh, some metrics uh, issues. So nothing interesting, but uh, one issue, for example, uh, stands out uh, is it's about uh, aborting uh, long running uh, unauthenticated connections. Yeah, for example, if a user uh, takes too long to authenticate uh, uh, via SSH, by SSH, uh, then the connection is aborted. Yeah, and uh, actually, there are some security reasons um, uh, for. This one, yeah, it's like uh, potentially user can, for example, uh, run a lot of connections. Eagle, sorry, can yeah. I interrupt just one moment? Can you please link the um the MR or or, or share your screen or both? So I I've linked the MRs in the documents. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and now I plan to let me check that everything is closed, so I can share my screen. So um, basically, there's um, open SSH option, which is called uh, login grace time. And uh, the description is that server disconnect after this time, if the user hasn't successfully logged in. Uh, why uh, it can happen, for example, long enough, yeah? Uh, when SSH protocol uh, perform the handshakes, yeah, uh, it's like two fourth, uh, two fourth uh, like communication with the user, yeah. Uh, uh, for example, SSH keys are negotiated algorithms uh, for um, for this keys are negotiated, yeah. And for example, when the user creates uh, creates a SSH key, um, for example, like. Uh, ah, no, it's not like this, uh, sorry. Uh, for example, using like this command, yeah? You can, uh, for example, also set a passphrase, yeah? Password for your uh, SSH key, yeah? And why it doesn't matter, for example, when you try to authenticate, yeah? Um, and- uh, so, Sorry, quick question there, Igor. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, were, what were those two settings there? The, the minus B and the, and you're, you're providing the protocol, are you? Um, the, uh, no, the it's uh, no, it's about it's about uh, generating a yeah. SSH SSH key. It's like uh, um, you can gen generate an SSH key with a particular algorithm. Yeah, like RSA or uh, like. Let okay. Me, I don't know whether it shows and, and, and which we, options are available. And, and do we somewhere? Uh, yeah. Do yeah. we somewhere have a list yeah, of which like algorithms this. we accept at GitLab? Or do we accept mm -hmm. all? We, yeah, we, we don't. All we them? don't have. Uh, we don't have it in the um, documentation yet. But I plan to do it uh, retrospectively. But uh, for example, uh, almost all of these algorithms we accept, except this one. Yeah, it was deprecated uh, okay. long ago, maybe a couple of years ago, and uh, now we um, literally for forbid it. Yeah, and. Uh, these algorithms are usually used, uh, used, and this one, uh, SK, means like security key. It's about 
YubiKey physical device that allows you to authenticate. Uh, this one, I, I remember this one were gifted on the first contribute in, uh, I mean, I mean, not the first, my first contribute and uh, first and only in New Orleans. Yeah, uh, there was a gift present from the company and I, I lost it in, in the hotel room <laughs> in the New Orleans, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> so maybe if I haven't lost it, I could uh, test it. <laughs> I could have tested, but uh, I couldn't. And I had to ask uh, yeah, uh, people, team members from um, Access Group to to test it for us yeah Imre I, we, I've asked Imre to uh, test it yeah so yeah we with this comment uh, with this utility we can generate a SSH key pair it's like private and public key so um, yeah where can we have a look which algorithms are algorithms are supported it's like uh, calling a SSH comment with uh, this option yeah it's like Verbose, yeah. If you need uh, like more verbose, yeah, <laughs> you provide multiple letters V. So uh, it's like this comment, it's uh, only shows like debug level one. If uh, if we provide multiple uh, letters V, debug level two, debug level three, it's like more, more information, more details. And uh, so, uh, this option helps helps us to. Ah, my bad. What should I do? Okay, it actually it doesn't matter. So, uh, since we provided the passphrase, yeah, uh, the handshake can hand, and uh, so the connection can take uh, as long as it can. Yeah, and uh, for security reasons and and also for cleanup reasons, we want to time out those connections. And actually, I've uh, the current default setting is one minute, yeah, sixty seconds. Uh, I tweaked it now; it's five seconds locally, and we received this error, which could be better and uh, which uh, couldn't contain the uh, like address, my address. But uh, actually, in the logs, I. I see that sometimes this timeout is hit. It's not like a huge number, but uh, still, uh, still it cleans up like idle connections. And uh, yeah, for security reason, uh, a user uh, can, for example, initiate a lot of uh, unauthenticated, uh, uh, unauthenticated connections and waste our memory, even though it's like low low consumption and uh, regarding the implementation it was implemented uh, twice <laughs> because i implemented it first with uh, like timers uh, in go language yeah basically it's like uh, providing a function which is executed after after some like period yeah and this period is configurable and if uh, actually, the, uh, the authentication was successful. Uh, the first fun function, yeah, it's called every time. After um, it's called every uh, when the function is complete, the first fun function is called, yeah. And uh, so, when we successfully authenticate, we stop the timer. So the logic is, if we successfully authenticate, uh, the timer is stopped. If we didn't this function is called yeah and uh, usually uh, such functionality it's usually performed uh, with the um, context yeah uh, gola uh, go language yeah it has like context me mechanisms yeah and uh, it's actually best practices to provide context uh, but uh, ssh external library it didn't accept context so we had to be creative and uh, like close the connection and when the connection is closed then this the execution is interrupted so uh, why i have reverted to this implementation because we had uh, like an issue with uh, cancelled requests and i was debugging this issue and i didn't know uh, what is the reason yeah so i i thought maybe i didn't know something about uh, go language uh, timers and some 
and uh, some timers were leaked yeah and just closed the connection and i didn't know why um actually the, that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't the reason yeah but i rewrote it and uh, then decided to re-implement it when we actually realized what was the reason of uh, cancelled connections and uh, when the second implementation was provided i noticed that uh, actually the the connection interface yeah it provides an implementation of a set deadline function so we could just set the deadline of a particular connection so the current implementation is that uh, the deadline is set for a connection and when the and when we have like um, Sorry, I forgot where it is. Okay, I don't see it, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, here, sorry. Yeah, when we have like successful authentication, the deadline is reset. It's like set to uh, zero and now the connection can be authenticated connection be, uh, can be as long as, as it wishes. So this so, is so, the so current this, so this implementation. Is this is built into the con uh function and it basically performs the same function as what you're doing yeah it's uh, the same functionality but uh like here we rely uh, rely on the uh like standard library implementation we don't yep. impl implement it on our own so okay. it's like more reliable yep. so that's uh, pretty it and Something like this, <laughs> and uh, maybe just one uh, uh, interesting part is that uh, it's about deserialization. Oh, uh, maybe it's not so interesting. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, so maybe yeah, we can skip it. But yeah, that's that's it. I guess yeah. Any questions? <laughs> Yeah, thank you for your explanation. It was very interesting to see how it works because for me, there's like go functions with defer func. It's like something new. I don't think I ever use them like by myself, but that's like uh, an interesting concept. And yeah, and uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted. Oh yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned uh, that uh, it was not clear what was the reason of this like mm -hmm. canceled uh, requests. Mm -hmm. And after the implementation, it, I believe it's resolved. So I'm curious, what mm -hmm. was actually the reason? Was it the problem in space? Uh, uh, yeah, the problem was in another place, yeah. And uh, maybe it's a topic, maybe let's discuss it uh, Discuss it next time. I, I'll prepare like uh, an explanation because yeah, it's like uh, requires an explanation of why we had a particular problem and how we resolved it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will be, will be happy to, uh, yeah, discuss it next time. I yeah, see. and regarding the defer functions, yeah, actually, uh, why it's why it's useful, uh, uh, because yeah, we could just, um, yeah, let me have a look. Mm -hmm. For example, at this one, yeah, uh, actually, yeah, if we just uh, call this um, this block after this uh, yeah. this call yeah that would be sufficient yeah on the um on the first at the first glance yeah but uh, why it's useful to do it like this uh, maybe for some particular cases that uh, this function is called no matter whether the execution was successful or not because mm -hmm. uh, we could have we could have multiple returns in the function yeah mm -hmm. and uh, after each uh, like uh, wherever the function exited, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. this defer function is, is called. So we we don't have to uh, call this this block after each return in, mm -hmm. in the in the function. So uh, that's actually useful in this case. Yeah, nice. um, maybe maybe it would be. I I recall where we have uh, like a better use case for this one. Uh, for example this long long function yeah uh -huh. uh, we have uh, like multiple returns here like and and here yeah at least uh -huh. two uh, and uh, if we didn't have like this defer uh, concept we 
uh, we had to call like this uh, block every time after mm -hmm. the return. Yeah, or maybe, or maybe, yeah. So, so, uh, uh, some, so yeah. after any of those returns, this defer function will be called. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, re return function is called only once. Yeah, so mm -hmm. uh, because yeah, and uh, yeah, after any of this uh, return yeah. uh, calls, uh, like defer, deferred function is uh, called. Yeah, mm -hmm. and why it's actually useful here that uh, like it's about this error uh, variable. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not uh, it's uh, like not instantiated somewhere in the function mm -hmm. uh, body yeah it's yeah. Uh, like initiated in here like a param mm -hmm. uh, parameter so it's useful because uh, we can modify the return return uh, mm -hmm. parameter yeah return argument mm -hmm. so uh, before before it's actually finally returned so nice. So th this uh, this error uh, mm -hmm. it appears uh, here, yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. and if it's not new, it's like we can yeah. perform some yeah, function, or maybe we can even uh, modify it. If it's not new, we can make it new or make uh -huh. it some other other function. So if, you, for example, we can we want to modify the the mm -hmm. message, for example, the, mm -hmm. that message from a st standard library. Yeah, mm -hmm. if we want to just strip this. Um, Eagle, Eagle, can I can I stop you there? Um, sure. Yeah. Super, super super interesting. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I'm thinking uh, maybe we need to extend the time on this. Maybe we need to have one 30 minutes is more is better to have t more time for questions or whatever. Um, uh, but, sure. But, yeah, I, but, I just decided to elaborate on this topic because it's just like general things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, that's the whole. That's the whole yeah. point of this. The whole point of this exercise yeah. is, is exactly what you're doing. Um, but yeah, I know but we've, thanks, got Robert, yeah. we've got Robert waiting. So, um, yeah. so what we'll do is what we'll do is we'll, we'll we'll switch to Robert now. But next time, I think um, I'll set it up so that we have more time. But thank you so much. That's super interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I think I've fixed mine now. This is the first time I've tried sharing a screen on this laptop, so that's why it uh, it failed. So I got pulled into a uh, a different rapid action, um, which was one of the sort of dumbest problems with uh, GitLab that I've had since I've been here. Even worse than the avatars breaking one of the controllers. Um, this one was when you enable group level IP restrictions, which is one of the reasons why all of this work exists like the sshd all of this sort of stuff um is because this feature exists that i didn't even know existed is that you can block by like, ip addresses from accessing group level when you enable that if you didn't include the 10.0.0.0 range gitlab itself breaks because you whoever implemented it originally didn't allow for the other parts of GitLab connecting to itself. So the, uh, but the thing is, this wasn't very obvious because the workaround for all of the SSHD problems was to allow the 10 0, 0, 0 range so that without the proxy protocol stuff, uh, it would still work because it was getting the 10 IP ranges coming through the, um, through the load balancers and stuff. The problem being that when you remove that, because we fixed the SSHD stuff, is that then immediately GitLab Pages breaks, because GitLab Pages is Pages is Pages apostrophe daemon has to connect back through the application to fetch the artifacts from CI runs so that it can render the pages. So the moment that we fixed everything else. GitLab pages would no longer be able to show any pages, which I thought was quite special. So uh, this is quite a simple merge request to fix it. That was uh, it's, it's, it's kind of frustrating because I hate doing anything that involves the database at GitLab because it just takes so long. So it adds an extremely boring admin setting um, that allows people to set a globally allowed IP range or set of IP ranges. Um, and this just then allows you to ignore 
That's global at the instance level. Robert. That's global at the instance level. So on .com, they've been configured for our GitLab pages IP ranges, which is like 10.124.0.0, I think, something like that. Um, and then it just ignores all of the group level IP filtering. So it's, it's a pretty straightforward merge request in a lot of ways. Um, adding an admin setting was like, it's not ideal. It's got a text limit of 255 characters because I couldn't be bothered to <laughs> set it bigger, but that's fine for the moment. Um, and it doesn't really cause any problems. So, I mean, half of this is just that, but the actual, um, uh, thankfully, I think the geo guys had already run into this problem in the past in a similar way. So I was able to copy a lot of their work and I copied a lot of the geo stuff. Um, but it doesn't do anything particularly exciting. What it does do is validate that someone's putting correct IP addresses using, so it can do, um, I call it CIDR notation. I don't actually it's supposed to pronounce it that way. Um, lots of admins. The only interesting bit in it really is here where you've got the, uh, it does the group, oh, it's a go away pop-up thing. Um, this bit does like the group IP check uh, where it's checking if the IP restriction and allows the current address. And all I've added is an additional one that um, <clears throat> if the previous one blocked it, would then check it against the globally configured stuff. And then it's just got a simple feature flag behind it. And then I think pretty much everything else is irritating spec coverage for it, which I believe we had to ignore stuff. We've had a lot of problems with um, uh, the under coverage reports and things like that recently, where they're just not picking stuff up. And it turns out that they've just been running the wrong files sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so there's apparently a fix in for that. But uh, yeah, so the, so the fix was actually remarkably simple. And um, it's just behind a feature flag at the moment in production for uh, our customer who had this problem. And um, uh, there are sort of future changes because having to enable it per group, like in a feature flag or whatever, is kind of irritating. Um, and it turned out that I'd set up the feature flag in such a way where you have to enable it for every subgroup too. So for them who have 5,000 groups or something, they uh, were not particularly entertained by that. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, John, you click the raise hand. Yeah, I did. Yeah, so sorry. Yeah, you, you just can't, you are elaborating, but so we have a feature flag that's per group. Yes, I did, I although it's that. actually enabled globally on .com now. So it's enabled for all groups because uh, originally we were just going to test it, but as it turned out, that was too much hassle. So okay. I went on holiday and then it got enabled globally while I was away. So it's perfect. I didn't have to deal with anything. Okay, so, um, so, once we <laughs> so once we enable proxy, we don't have to do anything else. No, although one thing that I will probably do is either remove the feature flag or... Right allow an option for group admins to break things if they desire because there might be a reason why some people want to block the pages demons from being able to access their projects maybe it's a security sort of concern so potentially we'll add a, a checkbox to that um yeah, it was, it was largely a very uninteresting merge request that took longer than it should have done because I had loads of spec problems and stuff like that, but it, it did solve the problem. And that's the only merge request we had to make, as far as I know, for the, the rapid action. I don't think there was anything else in it, actually. Um, we did a load of testing around the pages stuff, and it turns out it breaks the CI as well, which is kind of fun. So essentially, you turned on this group level setting and it just broke everything of no like you could do the commits and stuff um but you couldn't um yeah you can run ci jobs <laughs> uh still can't do that that's, that's still, still the case work. yep that's, that's yeah. yep so 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 robert explain again about the um the subgroups yeah Is so it as it turns out that group uh, when you use a group as the subject in a feature flag, 
it is very specifically that group mm. when you're enabling it for a group uh it won't do all of their uh descendants as well so for the customer who have the most crazy project and group set up i've ever come across um they have something like eight thousand to ten thousand projects mm -hmm. or something like this mm. like repositories which is just i mean we don't even have a thousand i don't think at gitlab so it's just a really insane number and they have the same problem with groups as it turns out um so that was something that was interesting to learn um though thankfully i was on holiday when we learned it so um that was someone else's problem to fix <laughs> and, and and that problem was solved by not enabling it by group just enabling it for everyone yeah they just enabled it globally in the end um because it's a fairly harmless thing as well like the ip allow listing was already broken anyway so uh, it wasn't going to break anything worse um I think the main takeaway for for me from all this work was that this is a weird feature to have in the first place. Like I, I've mentioned it to you as well, Sean, but like we've basically built a half of a firewall inside a Ruby application, and that's just the world's weirdest choice to me. <laughs> it's one of the, it is one of those things. Is like I know that probably this customer requested it, and that's why it got built. But there's been an awful lot of problems off the back of it that would have been solved by just not doing it in the first place. And saying no, we can't do that. But yeah, that, that's not something I was involved in. So, <laughs> well, in interestingly, there are a very limited number of customers actually using this. Um, yeah, that wouldn't surprise yeah, me. It's yeah. just bizarre. Like, if you care about this stuff, I think it's you like just six, it seven customers or something are using it. Yeah, yeah. It's it, like if you if you care about this, and if I cared about this, like, oh yeah, I really need IP restrictions. Um, I would do the self-hosted install. Where I have full control over my network, not do it like in a really bespoke way. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, and I think the worst part of this, not that it exists in the first place, because I kind of get it, even if I wouldn't have done it that way, is that none of us use this. So, unlike most of the application, literally no one at GitLab has run into this problem because we don't use it ourselves. Um, I didn't even know the feature existed until the rapid actions popped up. I said, like, oh, that's, that's curious. <laughs> um, and I don't really know. I mean, we could actually do this at GitLab to a certain degree, but it, it does like just to make sure that we know what's going on. But yeah, I mean, we were almost, you could almost make an argument that we should do it, right? That we should yeah. do it from our VPNs and, um, you know, yeah. just for additional security. I, mean, I think the biggest takeaway though is that uh, as someone who had to do it about 10 to 20 times putting the ip address ranges in that list for the group is extremely tedious you can't copy paste into it you have to add them individually there isn't there's an open issue somewhere about uploading a spreadsheet good yeah. <laughs> after about the fifth time i did it and the other uh, guys who are on the rapid action with me Everyone was like, this is so painful having to put, and especially when you like have an IPv6 address as well, like I do. So you have to add both in and you have to stay, and it's so long and everything starts getting really, but the, the thing is it actually, the way it works makes a lot of sense because it allows it to be infinite in terms of size, because it's actually going into a table. So I can't necessarily say there was a better way of doing it. Uh, I just know that it's kind of annoying as it currently is. I've got another question, but uh, does anyone else have a question before me? I have like a small question. I'm uh, mm. just trying to understand this like allowed groups. Mm. So if we, so we have like some IP list, like on group level, we have also IP list. It's like a new feature on the like instance level. Yeah. And they kind of, we do the combination of both. Let's say if I access the group, then I will check the group level IP allow uh, allow list and also the instance one. Yeah. Or they kind of yeah. Uh, so or yeah. well, well, do you only check the instance one if you fail on the group? Yes, that's why it does now. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I actually thought I'd done it the other way where it just combined the two, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I figured actually you can just save a check mm -hmm. by just checking if it fails the group level one because. In some respects, like it doesn't really matter if the group mm -hmm. level one's already 
allowing those on custom installs and things, then it it will be totally fine. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's the way it currently works. So it's kind of an addition. So I am just thinking yeah. about if like group level can redefine the global level somehow. Well, it's not the case for this problem. No, yeah. So it's sort of like a backup in case uh, you break something, um, mm -hmm. because in theory, I, I was worried that other parts of the application could break too. Mm -hmm. um, but the whole way that the I like this listing, uh, like my merge request doesn't touch it, but all of the authorization for this takes place in one of the policy files mm -hmm. in a fairly nondescript place. Um, and it only gets called on certain API endpoints. Oh. So the reason why it wasn't, like it doesn't affect mm. Gitterly because Gitterly's API endpoints do not use this authorization policy, mm. but the other ones do. And so that was a bit of a weird route trying to figure out where it even happens in the application. Um, and yeah, so I went for the, the easiest change, which was to just do a second check. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which uh, it shouldn't be slow though, because the uh, it's it's pretty much just a regex check, uh, as far as I know, with the CIDR notification library. So it's not um, it's nothing particularly awful. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So 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 it's in when you say policy, it's like declarative authorization. That's yeah, that, it's that module. Okay. Yeah, and it's just like a single line. It's so bizarre. It feels like this should be some sort of really in depth feature, and it's got all its own like. But no, it's just like one policy thing written somewhere in the middle of all the policy files. And um, it really was a bit obscure to find. Um, but it does seem to work. It, it was just a bit bizarre. Originally, we were thinking of just excluding um, like the GitLab pages endpoints that it calls, but it actually does call the API specifically to get these artifacts from CI jobs. The bigger problem is that the CI runners use public IP addresses. So the GitLab pages one goes through the internal Kubernetes uh, like routing layer. So when they hit uh, the Ruby application, their IP address is the internal one, which is why this works. Um, but the GitLab pages, uh, not GitLab pages, the, the CI runners go through the public API through the load balancer. So they go out and back through Cloudflare. So they use their public IP addresses. And so that is still broken if you enable this. The expectation is that if you're a customer who cares about this, you run your own runners, which that big customer does. Um, I, can why... add some, I can add some context to that. Yeah. So the reason they're going through Cloudflare is... Um, is because of DDoS, yeah. right? So, um, and but the the question that isn't answered is to is why can't we um, provide a list of our GitLab runner IPs? And um, yeah, I presume because they change quite a lot. Um, I mean, you could automate it, so that might be something for the runner people to do. The whole um, the rapid action did get complicated quite fast when the CI guys got involved as well. Um, because what, uh, someone did join and say, oh, yeah, this is by design. It should break it. It's like, no. <laughs> no, it shouldn't. I'm not going to argue about this. It's just weird. Like, oh, yeah, you enabled this feature on GitLab, and GitLab's broken now. Great. Good job. It, it just it is bizarre, even if it on some level does make sense, um, to essentially have a checkbox that just is like, yes, please break my application. I don't want this to work anymore. Enable. Um, it's quite a strange, uh, strange thing to have. So the CI stuff, I mean, the CI stuff, it to me is a little bit bizarre in that if this customer doesn't want to run GitLab self-hosted, but because they don't want to do that, they've got this weird feature and then they have to self-host all their runners. I was like, well, if you've done that, why don't you just self-host GitLab? <laughs> Well, th th I, we're, we're over time, although I do ha I'd do. i like to just feed in one more question if that's possible. Sorry, does yeah. it, anyone else have any more questions? Um, yeah, just can you just clarify about the IP6 and 4? You're saying if you have IP6, you have to also put in the 4? Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, this is kind of uncommon, I think. I have a very nerdy ISP. 
um, in the UK. It's, it's run by like techies and network guys. So I have both my own static IP address in uh, like an IPv4 address. And I have my entire own IPv6 range. So I have like 48,000 IP addresses that I'm allowed to use in my house um, on the IPv6 range. So I do. I don't use all of those, but you, know, I, it, you do use IPv6 delegation. And so my, all of my home network have IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. But it, whether it works or not, depends on both ends of the system. So GitLab does support IPv6 on gitlab.com. It doesn't necessarily support it in self-hosted stuff. So when I was testing my setup, my IPv4 address was showing up because the uh, like my test setup would only pick that one up. But when I was testing it on .com, which supports IPv6 is picking up my IPv6 address. But when you go to Google and it's like, what's my IP? It just gives you your IPv4 address, like most of the time. So I spent about two hours banging my head against the wall as to why the thing wasn't working. It turns out I was just using the wrong IP address for myself. So it's, a bit, it's, it's really hard to tell which one you've used on which website. Um, well, but, the, the world of IP6 yeah. is just mind blowing. It makes it's an absolutely horrible standard, and the only reason that I do it is like some sort of nerdy bragging rights to say, "Oh yeah, look, I've used IPv6." <laughs> but the actual thing is ridiculous, and you can't memorize the IP addresses, and it's just yeah, it's it, is, yep. it is really tough. But it does technically support both. The only problem is if you do the IPv6 addresses, they're really long, and you'll probably run out of field space quite quickly. So, 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 yeah. so does that mean in, in, in practically you could put in, you've got your two IPs, right? So you could put yeah. either of those into the allow list and, and if it should work, if you put yes. either of them. Yeah. Right. That's what I ended up doing. Okay. Um, I actually put like, um, uh, with IPv6, there's no like NAT. There's, so there's no, um, like this is my external public IP and these are my machines, internal IPs. All of your machines have essentially a public ipv6 address okay. okay they're just not publicly accessible they're like descendants of it um so yeah the whole thing was just like why did i do this to myself but it was useful to know because you know there, there will be someone else like me probably someone like nick who does this for fun um and ends up with a really confusing ip problem but yeah it's uh it, that yeah that was a waste of like two hours of my life <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily, because you're now the person to call on the next incident related with this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. The, the only other guys who have any interest in it in GitLab, I think, are in the um, the distribution team and stuff. So I think they've they've come across it, or the um, like the system admin guys. But uh, yeah, no one no one uses it, but we do technically support it. So it's well, okay. Well, thank you, Robert. We're well over time, so I'm going to stop the recording. Um,